Great. Welcome to the presentation on contract understanding access data set. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so for today's session, we're going to start with an introduction of the speakers today. And then I will give an overview of the ADCAS project, a nonprofit organization, and the curator of uh, um, the quad data set. And then um, me and my colleague, Dan and Colin, will uh, preview the performance results and observations. Uh, and then I will specify a couple of the use cases for quad and then continue on with a description, uh, a, a, a summary of uh, our next steps for 2021 and how we can work together to drive change. And then we'll leave the last 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. All right. So um, first of all, um, my name is Wei Chen and I'm the founder of uh, the ADCAS project. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization. So I um, started my legal career about 20 years ago. Um, I first uh, started practicing in private practice at Scandal Arps in Chicago and then at Cooley in Palo Alto. Uh, subsequently, I have been um, uh, the, the lead in-house counsel for strategic transactions at Sun Microsystems and at um, uh, Salesforce. Um, Dan. Hi, I'm a third year PhD student at UC Berkeley studying machine learning. And uh, I got involved with the Atticus Project uh, uh, almost a year ago. And um, what uh, I helped with was run uh, some of the experiments and try and design the task so that it can be suitable for the broader natural language processing community. Colin? Uh, I'm Colin. I recently graduated from Columbia. Uh, I'm currently a visiting researcher at Berkeley, and I'll be starting my PhD in artificial intelligence in the fall. Uh, so I guess I especially focus on various aspects of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, especially natural language processing. So I, I also helped out with uh, lots of the uh, actual experiments. Great, thanks so much. As I mentioned, um, ADCAS project is the uh, curator of uh, uh, Quad dataset, and we're a nonprofit organization that is organized uh, uh, and founded a year ago, um, comprised of a group of legal experts and law students passionate about accelerating AI development in contract review. Um, so before we're trying to find uh, the solution, we need to formulate the problem statement. What problem are we solving? So the problem we're solving here with the ADCAS project is contract review. Um, I divide contract review into three levels. At the lowest level, level three, this is the, um, the finding needle in the haystack problem. Uh, let me give you an example of a contract. So for example, in this master supply agreement in one of our data set, um, you will see that this contract has about 20 or so provisions and uh, a whole bunch of subsections uh, under those uh, 20 provisions. And yet you know, only the green highlighted provisions within this 10 or you know, 11 page contract are things that is worth of attorney review. Um, so you will see that, you know, this is uh, a, a very much of a, a finding needle in the haystack, haystack problem. Um, our uh, data set has shown that only 0.25% per category um, of the uh, clauses are actually uh, responsive to one of the ADCAS labels in the contract. Um, so going back to um, the level three contract review, and then after, you know, this type of work is typically done by the most junior uh, level attorneys. These are attorneys that, who are uh, one to three years out of uh, law school and who has just started their, their career. Um, and then they would be tasked with finding a list of um, contract provisions that we believe are important for attorney uh, continuing review um, for the um, uh, for the contract. So, um, for example, you know the forty one labels that we have identified 
are the 41 labels that we believe would be important for a detailed attorney review, a more senior attorney review in the corporate transactions, such as mergers, acquisitions, IPOs, corporate financing, um, uh, uh, and et cetera. Um, so after you're done with the level three review, the uh, selected provisions are being passed on to a mid-level attorney. And that mid-level attorney is going to look at the clause uh, in the whole context of the contract and in the context of the deal, and then do a more thorough analysis of whether this is important or this is not important. Is this something that's worth informing the client? And then once they do that, they escalate that issue to a more experienced lawyers. This is typically uh, a partner at a law firm or a senior in-house counsel where they would call their clients and say, hey, you know, we found uh, this problematic provision and it's in this contract. And the reason why it matters for you uh, is because of this. And then here are the recommended solutions that we propose in order to remediate that risk. So the ACUS project and the Quad data set is really trying to automate the level three contract review task. Uh, because of three reasons. One is because it is truly a finding needle in the haystack, haystack problem that you know, I talked about. Um, very time consuming, even me, you know, being an experienced at this, you know, reviewing a contract I just showed you probably is gonna take me somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes just to give it a thorough review. Um, it is slow and costly. So for example, you know, someone like me reviewing contract would be, it, I, I, my billable rates if I'm with a law firm would be over $1,000 an hour. And then most of this work is being done by the junior attorney at $500 or plus an hour at these big law firms. Um, it's not affordable to most consumers. That's why a contract review is only being done by big companies and big law firms in corporate transactions, such as M&A, such as IPO, it's not being done you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't necessarily mean that contract review is not a task that is suitable for your day-to-day -day consumers. It's only because, you know, so for example, you know, all of the audience in this group probably have already signed hundreds of contracts in your lifetime. Every time you uh, subscribe to an online service, you know, either it be Netflix or YouTube or Amazon or Google, you have signed our terms of services. You know, anytime that you apply for a credit card, you have signed uh, on uh, their terms of use. Um, and uh, nobody, you know, actually read those contracts, um, you know, line by line and then, uh, even fewer people uh, actually call attorney and spend the money to review those contracts, not because that there is not, you know, those contracts are not important, it's just because it's not affordable, you know, at the current rate. La last but not least, the uh, problem with the level three contract review is it's prone to errors. Um, as I mentioned, this task is mostly handled by the most junior attorneys. Um, it, it's, a, it's a skill that takes years to perfect. And as soon as you perfected it, you move on to a higher level task so you don't get to do this anymore. Um, and also most of the attorneys who are doing this task is under extreme time pressure, you know, like a few days or a few hours or, you know, maximum you get a couple weeks to review thousands and pages of documents. Um, in a very time prompt manner and then human fatigue factor comes in and it's just there's a there's a lot of misses um, you know um, in these type of tasks so perfect solution is uh, to use AI to help find the needles in the haystack so that the attorney can spend their time to review the the, the clauses that are actually important and that's why um, we started the Adcus project so the ADCAS project is really just, you know, trying to leverage and crowdsource the legal community as a whole to create a high quality open source data set on which the AI models could be trained and could be improved. Um, 
So we're lucky enough to attract a, a, a group of very highly experienced attorneys um, you know, and law students. As you will see in here, Quad uh, version one uh, has uh, the benefit of uh, many experienced attorneys listed here. Um, most of the attorneys have more than 10 years of experience. Many have more than 20 years of experience. And, and uh, the law students are um, uh, under the supervision of those attorneys. We're also fortunate enough to attract a whole group of passionate law students uh, who participated in our year round program. We have two programs. One is a part time program that is um, currently being um, uh, held at the with four law schools, Berkeley, Santa Clara, UC Hastings and Southern University Law Center. Um, and you know, that's a part time program, uh, three to 10 hours each week, uh, three months during the fall and three months during the spring. Uh, we have upped the hour commitment for these part-time program to six hours a week um, you know, coming next fall. We also have a full-time summer intern program where we attract students from uh, all of the law schools across the nation and the world uh, to help us expand this effort. And that is a full-time six to eight hours each day eight to 10 weeks uh, for the whole summer. And our summer uh, intern application is now open um, and uh, to all law students uh, around the globe. During uh, the past year, we have developed a very systematic and comprehensive training program around uh, the, the commercial contract data set and the 41 labels. Um, so the, the student would start with uh, a self-paced online learning uh, that includes a curriculum of over 50 modules hosted on Berkeley's online platform. And that uh, has four components. First, uh, there's the read portion. The students would come in and read some descriptions uh, about what a, a clause, a type of clause means. And then they move on to watch. The watch session is a video recorded of one of our experienced attorneys explaining what that clause means and how to find it. And then there's a assess uh, portion where you, you uh, look at some FAQs. And then last but not least, there's another session for you to quiz yourself uh, and then um, try to assess understanding. Then you move on to start looking at some of these contracts. Uh, while you're looking at the contract, uh, label by label, you're supposed to review um, a handbook. Uh, during the course of the year, we have developed a very comprehensive handbook to ensure quality and consistency. And that handbook is continuously to be um, revamped and improved uh, by our volunteers. And that's over 130 pages long now. Um, and then the students get together weekly um, on a, you know, via a workshop where they're uh, you know, doing the actual review of the contracts under uh, experienced attorneys with real time feedback. You know, these are student led working sessions, but then you will get the real time feedback from attorneys. These are the kind of things that, you know, like none of the law firms or none of the in-house counsel, uh, in-house legal departments currently have. Um, you know, legal is one of the apprenticeship uh, where skills are being passed down by watching how other people do it, uh, but there hasn't been a systematic process of uh, at the scale of teaching people how to identify these type of clauses. Um, you know, many of our um, attorney volunteers come in and look at this and say, I wish I had the benefit of this when I first started and uh, practicing. And I certainly felt the same, same way because I didn't get the benefit of, uh, of this. So the learning curve was very long, uh, which you know, now we have proven could be expedited. Um, and then in order to make sure that people really understand uh, the clauses, we have these uh, for, for every week, 
we send a, a pre-workshop quiz, making sure people understand uh, what they're, they need to look for and what is and what is not. And then after a, a couple of sessions, we also have a post-workshop quiz that has either you know, 50, uh, 60 uh, quizzes to make sure that you know, we continue to assess and improve people's understanding. Uh, going back to the handbook, the handbook has um, a detailed instruction of what a clause is, um, the keywords that you could use to find those type of clauses, and then examples of what is those uh, clauses, for example, most favorite nation clauses, and it also has examples and summary of what is not. Uh, so very practical um, uh, set of uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, we have just launched the ADCAS Open Data Fellow Program in collaboration with Berkeley Law and UC Hastings Law School. We're uh, both professional uh, legal experts, uh, practicing attorneys, and law students could apply uh, to help us scale um, our existing program. Um, we also developed a series of uh, tutorials called Bite Size AI. This is a series of five minute uh, tutorials to educate lawyers on AI so that you know when uh, you need legal advice on AI related matters that you don't have to spend their billable hour trying to educate them, we have done that job for you. Uh, and then we also host the Atkins and Beyond speakers. So this is a monthly series of speakers where we host um, thought leaders in both AI and law, trying to bridge a conversation, you know, trying to teach um, each other, uh, trying to speak the same language. Uh, so with that, I am going to um, head into the conversation about our data set, uh, the quad data set. Um, so on a high level, the quad data set is a data set of legal contracts um, that includes 13,000 labels in 510 commercial legal contracts that have been manually labeled under supervision of experienced attorneys. Um, the labels include uh, 41 types of legal clauses that we consider are important in connection with a corporate transaction, such as m &A, IPR or corporate uh, financing transactions. Um, we have published a paper on archive um, with our performance result, results and publications. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Colin, uh, who can explain uh, more in details. But uh, I would highly encourage you guys to check it out, uh, the paper from our uh, website and then um, learn about the, uh, uh, the different observations and results that we have, we have done. And also we have published uh, the code uh, that we custom trained on this data set on GitHub under MIT license so that you can take advantage of that as well. As I mentioned, um, you know, the quad data set is um, a, volunteering, a volunteer effort that is trying to promote the uh, AI research in legal. So everything is uh, open uh, source, free, freely available to everyone for use under the most benign license type. Uh, Quad, the data set is under CC by 4.0 attribution only. And our code is licensed under MIT. Uh, the contracts in the Quad data set is from this publicly available data set called Edgar. Uh, so Edgar is a data set that is uh, maintained by the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, this is a, a set of contracts, material contracts and other specified contracts, such as loan agreements and underwriter agreements, that every publicly traded company in the US or some of the foreign filers um, that's listed on the US stock exchange are required to file. Um, so this data is um, uh, publicly available and um, it's something, it, it, it's the basis for our data set that we uh, uh, did the human labeling. The contracts um, in quad version one are um, all commercial contracts. 
Um, so commercial contracts, you know, in the nutshell, is is the the type of contracts where you have a buyer and you have a seller, and then buyer and seller are exchanging goods or services for money. Um, it, it's not, you know, what, what, it's not um, organizational documents such as your article of incorporation or bylaws, and it's not employment agreements that were, you know, a, a company or a, a, an individual sign. It's not a loan. It's not a lease. However, is the largest category of contracts uh, that covers commercial transactions. So, commercial contracts is the largest subset of uh, contracts. Um, that's available. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, that we use 25 different types based on the names of the contract. Here, you're gonna see a visualization that we put together on a Tableau that is gonna show you some of the, um, the different types of contracts, you know, the development contracts, the intellectual property contracts and things of that nature. I wouldn't read too much into it. Um, you know, sometimes like people characterize commercial contracts into the big buckets of customer contracts and vendor contracts. And the title of that contract sometimes is arbitrary and I wouldn't um, give it too much emphasis, uh, emphasis on, on that. Um, and then uh, the way that we wanted to make sure that you know, the data set is random uh, and representative is we use the alphabet of the names of the filing companies. So we wanted to maintain a, a broad spectrum of from A to Z based on the name of the, the public filer. And the ACUS label is something that I've already talked about. These are the 40, um, one different type of uh, 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 clauses that we think is important in a corporate transaction. Um, it's crowdsourced um, by a variety of experienced attorneys in law firms and in companies. Um, and then they fall generally into three big buckets. Um, the, uh, the first bucket is the general and factual terms. This is, you know, the date, uh, the, 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 party, the party name, uh, the document name, the renewal date, uh, expiration date, and things of that nature. Um, the next um, category of uh, uh, labels fall into the category of restrictive comments. These are considered as the most restrictive um, uh, type of uh, provisions, problematic provisions uh, that would require you to uh, put some limitations on the way that you carry your, your business on a day-to-day -day basis, um, potentially requiring you to set up your operations differently. And then the next category is what we call remedy risk. So these are the lesser problematic type of clause, but uh, it potentially is not gonna require you to change the way that you operate your day-to-day -day business, but it's gonna create some revenue risk, meaning that you, know, you may not be able to recognize fully uh, the, the, the revenue that you expected out of that contract. Uh, terms such as, um, termination for convenience or change of control. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Colin, who is going to give an overview of the experimental results uh, that, that we have done and the observations uh, from those experiments. About sort of the technical uh, experimental side of things. Um, so this is basically covering, uh, I guess, as part of the release of the data set, we also released a technical paper um, and uh, this is sort of covering the results and observations from that. Um, and so, you know, because this audience is a mix of uh, presumably uh, legal uh, people and AI people, uh, I'll be keeping things that are relatively high level, um, but you can find many more details in the actual paper. Uh, so as uh, Wei said, uh, the task here is basically to sort of extract what are the important provisions uh, in a contract that a human should review. Uh, so that, that's sort of what we're trying to automate with uh, these AI systems. And so what does this actually look like? Um, well, you know, we'll, we'll have sort of uh, uh, lots and lots of contracts, uh, possibly stand, uh, spanning dozens or hundreds of pages. Uh, we'll feed it through a model and we want to sort of extract here sort of the, the key provisions, here are the labels that they correspond to. 
uh, and here sort of the, the location. Um, and so th this really is a problem, as, as Wei said, just to, to emphasize this point, uh, this is a problem of sort of finding needles in a haystack. Uh, a very small fraction of contracts uh, are actually important for a community review. Um, and so, uh, you know, models have to you know, look through dozens and dozens of uh, pages for these small number of, uh, uh, of relevant uh, provisions. So th this is sort of our task. Um, I, I guess when thinking about this, uh, we, we also need some measure of performance. Sort of. how, how do we know that uh, an AI system is doing a good or a bad job? And so that, that's sort of where metrics come in. And uh, because this is a problem of sort of finding needles in a haystack, uh, sort of the, the measures of success are um, a little bit different from uh, usual. Um, so there are actually a couple of goals that we have. So the first goal is sort of retrieving most of the relevant or important provisions. Uh, so we, you know, we sort of want the AI system to uh, present to an attorney what, what the attorney should look at. And we want to make sure that it doesn't miss uh, anything that's important. And, and so this sort of corresponds to this uh, notion of recall. Uh, and so basically, we, we sort of want the AI system to have high recall, uh, meaning it recalls or retrieves most of the, the important uh, clauses. Uh, at the same time, we, we want, um, I, I guess, one way of getting high recall is to uh, say that everything is important or everything is relevant. Um, but this doesn't save the lawyer time. And so we, we have this other desirable property, which is we don't want it to say that sort of, uh, lots of things are important that aren't actually important or relevant. Um, and so uh, this sort of corresponds to this uh, second metric that we have, which is uh, precision. Uh, so we want most of the things that most of the clauses or provisions that the AI system uh, raises to the attorney, we want most of them to actually be uh, relevant. Uh, and so the, this is basically a matter of we want to save uh, a lawyer uh, time. So these are the, the two main goals we have when thinking about this sort of system. Um, the issue is there, there's this trade-off between uh, precision and recall. Uh, and so you know, how do we actually summarize performance overall? There are a couple different ways of doing so. Um, I, I'm just going over this uh, a little bit quickly. If you don't follow completely, that's OK. Um, it, it is a little technically, th this is the most technical part of this, this talk. Um, but you know, basically, we, we look at two different summaries of precision and recall. So the first is area under the precision recall curve. It basically corresponds to you can smoothly vary how you trade off between precision and recall. This generates a curve. And then you can look at the area under this curve. You can just think about this as some number between uh, 0 and 1, or 0 and 100%. And higher is better. Okay, And, and this is sort of a smooth summary statistic of uh, performance. Okay. So that's one thing that we that we look at. The other, which is sort of, uh, I think, more interpretable and sort of closer to what we actually care about, is precision at 80% recall. Or you can look at other levels of recall, like 90 or 95% as well. Um, but what does this mean? It basically means, you know, if you retrieve or recall 80% of the re relevant provisions, what fraction of those are actually relevant? Uh, and so, you know, uh, this is a bit less smooth, um, but it, but it is closer to what we actually care about. And I'll illustrate this a bit more when we actually talk about um, results uh, uh, that we find with our models. Um, but basically, the, these are the measures that we look at. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than something like accuracy, but it is because this is a problem of finding needles in haystack. This is sort of closer to uh, what we what we care about. So I, I should have covered the gave an overview of the task. You know, what what are we actually having these models do? Uh, and I give an overview of what success means. What uh, what we're using to measure performance. Um, now I'll talk about the models that we look at. So within natural language processing, or NLP, there's this uh, sort of the, the dominant paradigm right now is to basically pre-train um, uh, models, AI models, on lots and lots of text. So tens or hundreds of gigabytes of sort of unlabeled uh, text, which you know, usually can, contains all of Wikipedia, lots and lots of books, lots of websites from the internet, um, usually filtered to be sort of high quality, things like that. And this pre-training, this first um, stage of training uh, is generally about sort of getting these models to learn uh, general aspects of language. After that, uh, you typically take these sort of pre-trained models and you fine tune them or train them a second time on more specific tasks. And so in our case, this means we're taking models that were pre-trained on lots and lots of uh, uh, text and we're fine tuning it, it on contract review specifically. And this is sort of making it uh, sort of specialized in a particular domain. 
um, getting it to learn a, a specific task well, having learned uh, some general background. Okay, and, and this is sort of an extremely successful paradigm that uh, uh, has resulted in uh, huge advances in natural language processing over the past few years. Uh, and so that, that's sort of the, the um, approach that we take here. Okay, and I guess just as a, another point, uh, uh, a, a general theme of um, progress in natural language processing in general over the, over the past few years is that you know, in general, bigger models and more data uh, is better, results in better performance. Uh, and so we, we see that again here um, uh, pretty dramatically, uh, especially in the case of data. Okay, so we specifically look at sort of four base models and we look at different variants of these. So overall, we look at 10 models, but so they're all based on these four. And so they're Bert, Albert, Roberto, and Alberto. Um, if you don't know what these are, don't worry about it. Uh, these are just for reference. Um, and so, but these are all sort of open source models um, that originally come from uh, companies, but you know, uh, they're freely available and these are all pre-trained. And then we did sort of the fine tuning ourselves on contract review in particular. Um, and so for, for each of these, we look at different sizes. And in some cases we do uh, additional experiments on top of that. Um, but just to give a sense of sort of what you know what these models are. Um, you know, these are very big deals. I mean, I think especially BERT is uh, sort of known for sort of revolutionizing natural language processing. It came out in 2018, and uh, uh, it completely changed. You know, it, it resulted in this dramatic increase in performance across lots and lots of tasks. And you know, Google is now actually using this as part of uh, Google Search. Uh, and so they, these are you know very good models. I guess even more recently, you know, Deberta, this uh, model recently, just in the past couple of months, released by Microsoft, um, this uh, made headlines from surpassing human performance on uh, Superglue, which is just this uh, very well-known natural language processing benchmark that uh, was very difficult, and so sort of for the first time uh, got human-level performance at this. So, so these are you know very good models, and this is sort of what we're using. Um, these we're, we're sort of fine-tuning these on contract review. Um, okay, so I talked about the task, I talked about metrics, I talked about models. Now to finally get, uh, I'll finally talk about uh, sort of results and observations. So first of all, uh, the, the best model, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, we found was Doberta. So this is sort of the most recent, the one from 2021, uh, and the largest model that we, we tried. And so here are some numbers. Um, some of these are sort of perhaps a little mysterious or difficult to in interpret at first. Um, uh, but I, I want to give some sense of, sort of what, what does this actually mean. Uh, so something like 50% APR and 50% 80% recall, like what, what does that actually mean? So I'll, I'll focus on the second point of precision at 80% recall. What this basically means is, you know, if you retrieve 80% of the relevant provisions, uh, about half of the provisions that the AI system says is important, that the, the human should review, about half are actually relevant and half should be ignored. And so, okay, should we be happy about this? Is this actually good? And I mean, basically, you know, if we're happy with 80% recall, this is actually pretty reasonable in the sense that, you know, if you have to just look through twice as many things as the number of relevant things, that's still a huge saving in, uh, in time compared to reading the entire contract. And so, you know, if we're happy with 80% recall, these models are already doing a pretty reasonable job. Now, are we happy with 80% recall? That sort of depends on the application. Uh, and so it's not totally clear, but you know we can look at other levels of recall, and um, it'll turn out we'll, we'll see later that you know performance is increasing very rapidly uh, at any level of recall that you you would take. So you know models are sort of starting to do something reasonable, and you know may, maybe this is sufficient for some some basic applications. And uh, so so performance is promising, even if it's not uh, perfect by any means. Um, so so that's the the best model, and just to give a sense of um, you know, where we are. Um, but we can also break things down by different provision categories. So we, we have these 41 different labels and we can look at performance across them. And this is you know, a, a bit less promising, but it, it's still, um, I guess we find that you know, performance varies pretty substantially across different labels. And so you know, some are extremely high, you know, close to 100%, which is sort of the optimal uh, level of performance, while some are much lower, at, you know, below 20%. And so in this sense, there's certainly work to be done, uh, especially. Um, and so, you know, the, these models are going to be, at least right now, they're, they're sort of more reliable for, for some purposes than for others. And so the, this is sort of an important thing to look at uh, when evaluating these models. Um, another thing that we found was that uh, labeled data is uh, a huge bottleneck here. 
And you know, Quad is introduced 14,000 uh, annotations, and it turns out that you know, if you use even slightly less, if you use something like 4,000 annotations, um, precision at 80% recall is zero. Uh, and you know, it's a little bit like you can look at different metrics like AUPR, and in that case, it's a bit smoother, but still increasing very rapidly. Um, but you know, th this is kind of the thing that we care about, something like precision at 80% recall. And when we look at this, you know, you really do need uh, more data to, to, to be able to actually get any reasonable performance. Uh, and so this just goes to show like how important and you know, how valuable this uh, data curated by uh, Wei and uh, her, her collaborators, uh, how valuable this actually is. Uh, so in addition to data uh, driving performance quite a bit, uh, improvements in AI are also sort of responsible for uh, lots of gains in uh, performance as well. And so if we look at just uh, some of these basic models, you know, BERT, uh, Albert, Roberta, and Roberta, um, there's a huge difference in performance across these. Uh, and so even just in the past three years, uh, performance, uh, I think, you know, uh, is something like five times uh, more than it was before, something like this. And so, you know, even just with the natural um, development of things in AI, uh, we're seeing these sorts of tasks being uh, becoming increasingly feasible. Uh, and so the, this is uh, also sort of a, a uh, promising trend. And so, so just to, to conclude, um, there are a few takeaways, I think, from this. So uh, you know, first of all, models currently have sort of, in some sense, uh, like pretty promising performance. Um, but they definitely have uh, shortcomings, and you know th there is plenty of room for improvement, and uh, certainly work to be done. Um, at the same time, you know performance is improving quite rapidly, both if you look at just increasing the amount of um, labeled uh, data, um, and also when looking at uh, improvements in AI in general. Um, and I, I think this uh, suggests to me that you know there, there's a role for both legal experts and AI experts to to really um, uh, make automating contract review uh, feasible. Uh, and so, you know, overall, I, I think this is all quite promising to me, and uh, it suggests that there is sort of a, a path forward to uh, actually automating uh, automating this task. And uh, I, I think that's uh, very exciting, and um, uh, it's an exciting time to be involved with this sort of thing. So, um, so that's all I have uh, to reiterate. Uh, there are many details that I had to admit because of time, but. Uh, please check out the paper, um, especially if you have a technical background and want to know more details about that. Uh, and we'll also take Q&A later, so feel free to ask questions then. Uh, and so with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Wei. Great. Thanks so much, Colin. Um, we will save the last few minutes, uh, last, you know, at least 20 minutes for uh, Q&A. So let's uh, feel free to put it in the chat function. Um, I want to cover uh, next um, use cases. Um, first of all, I wanted to make a comment of Colin's question of is 80% uh, good enough, you know, for for this particular particular purposes? Uh, absolutely, because I don't think human has already got to the 80% recall um, at this stage. You know, the higher the recall, the better. You know, I, I'm hoping for 90% recall so long as as you know we don't have to go back and completely redo the you know rate you know millions of of sentences, but 80% recall is already pretty good enough um, for, for uh, corporate transaction purposes, given the fact that, you know, it, was, it has been only done by junior attorneys and it has been uh, done by, um, you know, an, under extreme time pressure. Um, so the first use case, you know, if we have a, a, a AI model that gets us either 85 or you know, ideally 90% or even 80% recall at a, you know, more than 20% accuracy, 20% precision. Uh, we're looking at a, a tool that will be immediately useful for this use case called disclosure schedule. So what is a disclosure schedule? A disclosure schedule in the M&A transaction is essentially a list of contracts. Uh, it's a list of contracts that are respons uh, either responsive or exceptions to um, the seller's representations and warranties. So here I give two examples of the representations and warranties. The first one is asking for a list of all of the material contracts of the company. This sometimes result in the list of 200 contracts. Um, and currently the way it's being done is being done by human typing in 
word by word, you know, manufacturing agreement, comma, dated the state between this party and this, this party. And we're talking about like, you know, highly paid uh, individual attorneys that who are actually doing this work. Um, the second type of reps and warranties would be something like, you know, exception uh, listing, uh, something that correspond to a representation that would say, other than as set forth in the disclosure schedule, the company does not have any contract that contains a most favored nation clause. And that would require the AI model to be able to accurately, fairly accurately identify uh, the contracts that contain a most favored nation clause. And then with some like really quick, uh, you know, code and simple code and you know modification that we're looking at a product that is immediately useful. Um, so I, I created some mock-up um, of, of this product if it works, you know, to a certain uh, uh, accuracy uh, at recall and provision would be immediately useful. Um, so in the first instance, let's assume that you know this is a data room. The data room would just have all of those contracts, you know, let's say like 200 contracts in them. And then the AI, you know, would be able to pull all of those contracts across the 41 labels. And then we export it into a TSV file. Next, uh, what we do is we, you know, we had one of our high school volunteers actually wrote uh, 90 lines of code. We drag the TSV file into uh, a collab instance and then we put down a you know, drop down menu that has the 41 labels. And if we wanted to have a list of all of these contracts, we just say document name because everyone has it. Immediately within seconds, you see a list of 200 contracts that's being listed here exactly in the format that we want them to be. This is like hundreds of thousands of dollars of work that you know, I normally pay as a client. Um, in response to the uh, most favored nation rep, what you would do here is you go to most favorite nation. And then again, you click a button. And then, you know, the AI knows out of the 200 contracts, only nine of them has the, um, has the most favorite nation. And then you'll make a list of those nine contracts. Um, so that, that's one use case. Currently that is being done 100% by human, very expensive, takes a long time. There's a gap in the market. There's no product as far as I know that does this, if I can have something like this, I would buy it immediately. Um, second use case um, is called the divested contracts. Um, so in the divestiture, as, as you know, I'm limited by my expertise. So I'm a, um, you know, corporate transaction attorney by training. So I, you know, mostly uh, uh, focus on uh, mergers and acquisitions. So one type of uh, acquisition is called a divestiture, meaning that you know a parent company had you know decided to um, spin out one of its uh, uh, a part of uh, a company or part of its assets. Uh, so in this exercise, the parent company will need to transfer uh, the contracts that belong to the divested business to the new buyer. And in order to do that, they have to come up with a list of the contracts that belong to the new. To the to the divested product, you know, you use a use an example of like, well, let's say Alphabet or Google wants to divest DeepMind. You know, it's very difficult for a human to go through the hundreds of thousands of contracts that Google currently have and figuring out like which one is uh, belongs to DeepMind and which one doesn't. Right? If we have an AI tool that can parse through the party name and parse through some of the product name. You know, we can save a lot of effort and time and then uh, make sure that, you know, this, this product, work product eventually is, is accurate, um, you know, for, for lawyers like us. So this is also, again, a gap in the market that currently don't have a lot of time pressure, you know, in the high stake M&A transaction that people need this and people will pay money for this. So those are the two uh, use cases. I'm going on to the next um, agenda item, which is what we're doing for 2021. You know, Quad version one is a milestone for us, thanks to the contribution of Dan and Colin, that we have now finally got the uh, attention of the AI community. Um, we are not done yet. We'll continue going. 
Um, so the first goal, which is very achievable to us, is um, after the summer, we will be done with a quad version two with at least a thousand commercial contracts. As you probably saw from Colin's chart, there's several of the, um, uh, the provisions currently have a low performance. Um, we're going to go in and we're going to try to come up with some mechanism of creating more samples, you know, more clauses for those clauses. And we're going to do an industry-wide panel with, uh, with experts from leading law firms and in-house legal department trying to figure out like why the performance is low. Is it because human ourselves don't even understand, you know, what that provision means for us? There isn't a consistent understanding or is it because like, you know, the, uh, the category needs to be further refined. Um, we're gonna start with a new data set, um, uh, other categories of contracts, including leases, employment agreements, and loan agreements. And last but not least, we're opportunistic. You know, we are a nonprofit organization that's fully you know, con with taking advantage of the volunteers that who are passionate about this, this mission. And, you know, if there's uh, someone that who is passionate about data projects and who wants to lead it, we would love to help you get there and we would love to leverage the advocacy infrastructure um, to make, um, uh, you know, uh, the AI community making, uh, making more connections between the AI community and then the uh, legal community and leverage the power of AI to solve legal problems. So, you know, there's a lot to be done. I'm not, you know, at first I'm very optim optimistic and I thought this problem would be something that, you know, we just label a couple of contracts that will be done in six months. But as I continue to collaborate with uh, Dan and Colin, and I, especially when I saw the chart that has the low performance, I, you know, went into a couple of days of, you know, feeling pretty groomy about what the future might be. But um, this is, this is we're, we could not come at a better time. This is a time where we're going to see significant AI development, you know, from a tech, technological front in not only the next two years, but we're talking about the next six months. Um, and now we finally have an open source data set available for the AI scientists to look at, you know, and that is continuing. We wanted to continue that trend and start to uh, expand this effort and hoping that you know the uh, uh, that that is going to accelerate the AI development. So the Atkus project currently, um, you know, the, I, I made a, a list of the couple of benefits you know that we have for law students and, and the attorneys. First of all, Atkus project is an established brand amongst law schools, law firms, and in-house legal departments. Um, we have access to experts in law firms and in-house legal departments, not, not just one or two law firm, you know, the law firm that we're working with, you know, all of them, you know, alone are experts, but, you know, one firm and, or one big company has its bias, you know, Salesforce is a SaaS company, you know, Dal Monte is a, is a, um, a uh, grocery company. I mean, like everyone has our own bias and this is a platform where, where we bring in all of our understanding together and we're trying to create some consensus, you know, among the experts. We have already um, set up a, a set of training materials and infrastructures to ensure consistent and high quality training. And then the work that uh, the, the uh, framework that we currently put together with volunteer attorneys and law students is working and it's tr attracting a lot of good ta talents. Um, and we have a year round programs and student led workshops with a lot of passionate students that who are helping us. And we also have a lot of experienced attorneys that who are using our platform to reimagine the future of legal practice. What benefits do we have or can we bring to the AI community and to the general public? Um, you know, as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, contract review is being done only by big companies and big law firms only. Why is that? It's not because other people don't have the needs for contract review. They do. They just can't afford it today, right? Eventually, they would, you know, with all of your help, they would. And that will open up a huge market that currently is untapped into. 
ADCUS project and QUAD is a lab to experiment with other data projects that will teach not only law students about real life skills, but also solve like social problems. There are a lot of predatory contracts out there. People don't even know what's in there. It's, you know, the, the QUAD um, and other public data set is a treasure trove that we're trying to build it in different ways for ease of consumption, you know, with our Tableau visualization. Uh, with the different um, uh, format that we currently have, CSV, JSON, you know, and then we also published our um, tr um, uh, train model on GitHub. So you can, you know, take it and together with any open data set with the most cutting edge um, transformer from, from Google, from Microsoft, from Facebook, and just take it and then, you know, put our code on top and use it for whatever purposes that you need. Um, as some of you probably already noticed, um, all of our uh, data set and then the code is um, open sourced under the most uh, benign contract, uh, well, uh, license type that you can think of, you know, so the quad is under a C, um, a CC by 4.0 attribution only, and the code is under, um, is it MIT? Like, I can't remember, is it MIT license? Yeah, yeah. MIT license, okay. Um, we are established platform to engage developers and researchers. You know, currently, you know, Dan and Colin are helping out with us. We're in collaboration with a couple of industry players, you know, with the, the best and brightest, like an AI scientists. We're having constant conversations. Um, this is a resource to educate lawyers on basic AI concepts and enable lawyers to stay abreast of AI developers uh, developments. Why is it helpful for you? So you don't have to pay, you know, the, for their hourly rates to educate them. We've already educated them for you. And last but not least, you know, this potentially is become, will become a benchmark to evaluate AI tools. Everybody is talking about different F1 scores, you know, different precision scores, different recall scores. There's no common standard to evaluate that. Um, so with that, um, we currently have ADCAS Open Data Fellow Program uh, that's open for both experienced attorneys who can come in and lead their data projects, train our uh, volunteer law students and then help us bring this uh, bring in, uh, this to the public and scale the pro uh, the open data project. We also have a open data student fellow program uh, that would uh, you know, leverage the network of experienced attorneys and AI scientists to um, help train the, the future of talent. You know, I truly believe that in two years, things will be very different. Our way of practicing law will be different because what we have done here. Um, this is the contact information for us. Um, you know, feel free to send send us an email uh, if you wanted to get in touch with us. You know, we're you know a small nonprofit startup, very agile. We're optimistic. You know, like if you have a data project that you think is going to make a difference, we we would love to collaborate with you. 